Greetings. Welcome to ME4056 Systems Lab Refrigeration Presentation. This is Group 5, um, and we are consist of Megan, Jackson, Martha, and Lewis. The purpose of this lab is to experimentally characterize our motor voltage and pressure relationship, vortex tube relationships, and then we're spending two weeks studying the steady state heat energy transfer as well as a transient um, state heat energy transfer at the aluminum load and block. We will also be performing uncertainty analysis for all values supporting our conclusion. The experiment is set up in lab. You'll see highlighted in orange there is an open valve where ambient air is pulled in by the air compressor. The air compressor then um, allows the air to flow into the heat exchanger which is modeled at bubble A. Um, once the air is passed through the heat exchanger it goes into the accumulator tank out of the accumulator tank it goes up through the vortex tube where the hot air and cold air are separated. The hot air is um, emitted to the left and the cold air goes to the right and it, this cold air passes through the aluminum load which is in this figure insulated. Once it passes through the aluminum load it is emitted on the right. You'll see all along this um, flow of air there are bubbles one, numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. At each of these locations, we have temperature and pressure sensors, which allow us to collect data at various points throughout this process. At the beginning of each lab, specifically for week one, we use localconditions.com to get the local pressure, uh, which was found to be 1,022 millibar. We also used a thermometer in lab to get an ambient temperature reading as well as taking temperature or sensor offsets for uh, important temperature and pressure sensors as well as mass flow rates. After measuring the depth of the insulation device and using the equation in the top right corner, the theoretical thermal resistance was calculated to be 17.5 plus or minus 1.356. Our experimental values can be seen listed in the table above. The closest experimental value to the theoretical value happened at 2.5 volts. Mostly the theoretical value was higher than the experimental. This is likely due to the depth of the insulation surrounding the load not being the same and it not being fully insulated on all sides. The next step was to compare the theoretical and experimental values of Q ambient at steady state. Over on the left hand side you will see two variables and their equations to achieve those values. One is theoretical and the other is experimental. Over on the right hand side is the values that were calculated. Theoretically, Q ambient seems to increase quite consistently as input voltage increases. However, what we found through experimentation was that Q ambient stayed fairly consistent and higher than its theoretical counterpart throughout, with a couple outliers at 0.5 volts and 2.5 volts. This is likely due to heat loss to the surrounding environment due to the imperfect insulation. From this voltage versus pressure graph, we can see that voltage is a means of controlling pressure. Increasing the voltage increases the pressure. The relationship between voltage and pressure is nonlinear concave down, where the pressure shows signs of leveling off as the voltage increases. The vortex tube output separated cold and hot air. These two graphs display the temperature outputs at station 4, the end of the tube. As the pressure increases, the temperature of the hot air continues to increase at a near linear rate. However, the temperature of the cold air does not follow a linear model, leveling off as it reaches the limits of the system towards the higher pressure values. Overall, considering the goal is to cool the aluminum block, this indicates that the system reaches its limits during those higher pressure values and will not reach any cooler temperatures even with an increase in pressure or voltage. These are the mass flow rates through the vortex tube. The cold air moves at a linear rate through the range of P3. The hot air is nonlinear and has a lower overall mass flow rate. This indicates that the hot air could be accumulating somewhere else in the system instead of flowing through the vortex tube. Temperature measurements at different stations can indicate the capabilities of different parts of the system as well as help to analyze the accuracy for a model. The heat exchanger and accumulator are at station 3 and are meant to stabilize the pressure, where T3 is meant to be close to ambient. But from the table, the temperature increases approximately 5 degrees Celsius throughout the course of the experiment. This indicates an undesirable accumulation of heat that decreases the cooling capability of the system. T1 is the temperature output from the compressor. The compressor is meant to heat up the refrigerant and add pressure to the system, which is why the temperature is meant to be much greater than the ambient. From the table, we can see that increasing the voltage increases T1, but with the increase from 0 to 0 0.5 volts, V1 
being corresponding to 45 degrees and 2 to 2.5 volts corresponding to 22 degrees, T1 does not increase as much during the upper voltages, coinciding with it reaching a limit for how much pressure it is capable of adding to the system. From this chart, there is no observable difference in the pressure between the cold air at station 4 and at station 5. This essentially enables us to have an energy balance, where the energy transfer in the air is equal to the energy leaving the load plus the energy entering the system from the environment. These are the combined sensor uncertainties um, for K equals 1 for each of the sensors. Um, so it's notable that uh, pretty much all of these sensors, uh, the specifically the pressure sensor, the thermocouples, and the calipers, all of these the uncertainties are about two orders of magnitude smaller than any of the values used in any calculations. Um, the timing uncertainty for the Elvis Ford data acquisition is not useful this week because we're only doing steady state analysis, but it will be helpful next week when we're doing transient analysis. Um, and it is also notable that the uncertainty for the flow meters depends on the actual flow. Um, so as the flow increases, um, since it has been increasing with pressure, um, there is more uncertainty associated with that. So this is the equation for uncertainty for the theoretical insulation thermal resistance, um, which it was used uh, or was calculated based on the coefficient of thermal conductivity of styrofoam and the dimensions of the styrofoam and the load itself. Um, so basically, most of the uncertainty um, in terms of raw combined uncertainty is the caliper uncertainty. There is not another sensor uncertainty associated with this. So it simply depends on the magnitude of these different measurements um, compared to um, basically the magnitude of the thermal resistance. Uh, these are the equations for the experimental insulation thermal resistance, which is a much more complicated equation as seen earlier. Um, that it uh, involves values collected from the thermocouples, um, the pressure transducer, the flow meters, um, and as such, there's a ton more different um, components. It is noticeable that because of the, the flow meter component, um, the uncertainty does change uh, noticeably um, at different voltages. Um, as seen previously, the, the highest voltage um, had the highest uncertainty. This is, these are the uncertainty equations for um, heat transfer uh, between the load and the ambient temperature outside through the insulation. Um, and so here, uh, as before, it uses the combined uncertainty of the mass flow rate. Um, which means that it varies with the flow rate of the air. Um, but it is also involved, the thermocouple uncertainty is also involved. So looking ahead for the week two portion of the lab, we will model the transient cooling of the load while being cooled by the ambient air and by the compressor. This will be done by data collection of the variables listed above. We will then calculate the load energy balance for each transient response. Completing an uncertainty analysis will then allow the team to state the confidence associated with each value. After this is completed, we'll be able to form conclusions about the validity of the system modeling and the capabilities of the provided refrigerator. These are our references used for the report. Those include the lecture slides, lab guidance, and the equation sheet. And we just want to thank you for listening to our presentation of our week one findings of the refrigeration lab and our plans for the future lab. Have a great day.